Before they take a patient with a thyroid mass to surgery, surgeons at my institution will perform an unenhanced neck CT. Now you're probably asking yourself, they've already got the ultrasound, they've maybe even got a biopsy, why are they getting an unenhanced CT of the neck? The purpose of this lecture is to answer that question for you. There are several things you need to be looking for when you are interpreting a preoperative CT of the neck for a thyroid mass. One is to look for malignant features of the mass, and we'll talk about what those are. We want to know what the what effect the mass is having on the trachea in terms of how far the trachea is displaced and how much it is compressed. We want to know the extent of the mass. We want to know how far superiorly it extends, whether there's any retropharyngeal extension, and perhaps most importantly, whether there is substernal extension of the mass. Are the malignant features we can see in the thyroid mass on CT? One of the things we're looking for is fine calcifications, fine speckled calcifications. How fine? Remember, these are the same somoma bodies that are seen in breast cancer that are calcifying, and so they are micro calcifications, extremely fine calcifications. We often see coarse calcifications in association with thyroid masses. Those are neither worrisome nor protective of malignancy. It's these fine, fine speckled calcifications. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for extra capsular invasion. Obviously, that's going to be a sign of malignancy. You can get a very, very large thyroid mass, but it'll still be well defined because the capsule expands around the mass. We're looking for metastatic adenopathy, and we're looking for vocal cord paralysis. Even a large thyroid mass compressing on the recurrent laryngeal nerve won't cause vocal cord paralysis. You only get vocal cord paralysis when there is a malignancy invading into those nerves. So that is a, that's a strong indicator. What about size? If you have a huge thyroid mass, is that more likely to be malignant? In most situations, the larger the mass is, the more likely it is to be malignant. Is that true for these thyroid masses? The answer is the opposite. Large size is actually protective because if it were malignant, it would have caused a substantial problem before it reached that size. So most of the massive thyroid goiters we see are benign. How fine do the calcifications need to be to be considered fine calcifications? Look at this example on an unenhanced CT. You can barely make out the hyperdensity in the center of the mass. These are multiple tiny calcifications, none of which is discreetly evident on a CT because it doesn't have the resolution the way, say, a mammogram has. So this is what we're looking for, this hazy increased density. Here's another example where you can see just these punctate dots scattered throughout the mass. One more example fine calcifications. It just looks like a haze. Your only real clue here is that it's an unenhanced scan. You shouldn't be seeing anything so dense here. Be careful not to mistake some residual thyroid tissue within a mass or encased by a mass for fine calcifications. This is not normal thyroid tissue taking up iodine. This is calcium in a very fine pattern. Extracapsular invasion, when you can no longer see the edge of the mass with relation to the remainder of the thyroid gland or with relation to the surrounding structures like the strap muscles here. Another really important place to look, the tracheoesophageal groove. You should see fat in the tracheoesophageal groove when an aggressive thyroid mass extends beyond the capsule, it can destroy that fat in the tracheoesophageal groove and spread into the tracheoesophageal groove. That's an important finding of extracapsular invasion. Another example of extracapsular invasion, just again to show the loss of fat planes all the way around the thyroid mass. And I'm showing you the exact same image again as we shift to talk about adenopathy, because whether you noticed it, there actually is a central compartment lymph node here right behind the thyroid gland. It's a discrete mass. What do I mean when, it, when I say that it's central compartment? I mean it's 
between the medial edges of the common carotid arteries here. So that's central compartment adenopathy. One of the typical appearances of papillary thyroid carcinoma when it metastasizes to nodes is a node with no discernible wall. When we talk about squamous cell carcinoma, we're often talking about an enhancing rind around the center of a necrotic node. That's not what's happening in papillary thyroid carcinoma. There's no discernible wall around the outside, except that there's a nodule of enhancement. So we have mural nodularity, but no discernible wall. This is typical of metastatic papillary thyroid carcinoma. Here's another example of the same thing, a predominantly cystic node with no discernible wall. This is actually the internal jugular vein crushed uh, out to the side here, not a mural nodule. Sometimes they're not cystic. Here's a metastatic node where you can see those fine speckled calcifications that we were discussing within the primary tumor. Sometimes they'll appear within the nodes as well. Vocal cord paralysis is an important secondary sign. If we see medialization of a cord that suggests cord paralysis, remember though, you've got to double check that it is truly medialization of the retinoid cartilage. Medialization of the vocalis muscle is not sufficient. You've got to see that the a retinoid cartilage has fallen in, fallen medially. It's not perched out laterally as we see on the contralateral side. It's fallen in and it's pulling the true vocal cord along with it. You can see that this vocal cord has already started to atrophy. This isn't an acute paralysis. It's amazing to me how large a goiter can become and still be benign. This thing is a monster. It, you can see how it's distorting the anterior neck, and yet this is benign disease. It's all just a big adenoma. One of the important features that helps the surgeon decide whether surgery is necessary is the effect that the mass has on the trachea. So we want to categorize tracheal compression as mild, moderate, and severe, or and we want to categorize tracheal displacement as mild, moderate, and severe. So I'll show you some examples. This is what I would consider mild tracheal compression. You can see that the mass is all around the trachea. You can see that it's pressing on the membranous portion, but also the walls are starting to collapse down. It's still got a normal overall shape, but it's starting to lose its caliber. Mild tracheal compression. Here's what I would consider moderate tracheal compression. We've got more of an oval or saber sheath configuration to the trachea now. There's still plenty of room for air to get in. I wouldn't expect this patient to be dysmic from this alone, but uh, it's, it's clearly distorted. And once you get down to just a uh, clearly reduced diameter, then we start calling that severe tracheal compression. I often get asked, what are the numerical values? So how many millimeters should it be before you call moderate or severe tracheal compression? I don't use measurements. Um, also, you need to sort of get a cross-sectional area in your mind, not just a linear measurement. I, I prefer the subjective assessment. What do you do when there is a tracheostomy tube stenting open the trachea? I frequently get asked, is this, what's the degree of tracheal compression in this patient? And the answer is, you can't tell. Once you have a, uh, a tracheostomy tube stenting open the trachea, you can't figure out how much this would collapse when that tube is removed. And of course, everyone is loath to remove the tube just to check because it can be hard to get back in. So you have to defer in these circumstances and say the degree of tracheal compression cannot be assessed because the trachea is being stented open by a tracheostomy tube. We've talked about tracheal compression. We're going to do the same thing for degree of tracheal displacement. We're going to categorize it as mild, moderate, or severe. Here's a situation where we're just a little bit off of midline here. We'll call this mild tracheal displacement. We're still in front of the vertebral column. 
Now we're starting to get into moderate tracheal displacement, a larger mass. We're sort of off the edge of the tracheal column here. We'll call that moderate tracheal displacement. And where are we measuring this tracheal displacement, superior to inferior? Right about at the thoracic inlet, right where the manubrium sterni starts. So here's an example of severe tracheal displacement. We're way off to the side. We're behind the clavicle at this point. And you can see where we're probably putting some stretch on the trachea at that point. So that's severe tracheal displacement. Once we've talked about the effect on the trachea, then we're gonna talk about the extent of the mass. One of the areas we wanna talk about extent is retropharyngeal extent. And this is a yes or no question. Is there or is there not retropharyngeal extent? The importance here is that the surgeon's gonna to have to chase that and make sure that they get all of it out of the retropharyngeal space. Superior extent, how far does it extend superiorly? Choose an anatomic marker that makes sense. Here's the top of the goiter. It's at the same level of the angle of the mandible. It's at the same level as the carotid bifurcation of the hyoid bone. Whatever anatomic marker you choose to indicate the superior extent of the lesion. The most important direction of extension is substernal. Why? Because if a thyroid mass goes too far substernal, then the next surgeon is going to need help from a chest surgeon to crack the sternum and get sufficient exposure to get the mass out. You can go a little bit substernal, just tuck a little bit under the manubrium and still sort of berth it out through the thoracic inlet, but uh, any substantial substernal extent really changes the nature of the surgery. This is one of the most important things we're going to comment on on a CT because ultrasound may not see how far down it extends below the sternum. Uh, once again, you have to just choose an anatomic reference point and say the mass extends as far as the aortic arch, the carina, the origin of the great vessels. Choose an anatomic reference point so the surgeon knows when they've gotten far down enough to have, to have seen the entire mass. Here's another example. This time I would say something like, there is substernal extent to the level of the origin of the great vessels. Sometimes a sagittal reconstruction can be helpful to show you what the lower extent of the lesion is and to give you some anatomic reference points. Now, what if a mass extends here between the head of the clavicles, but not quite underneath the manubrium sterni. Is that substernal extent? The answer is no. I need to see the manubrium sterni on the same cut as the mass in order to say there's substernal extension. In this situation here, I'm gonna say the mass extends into the sternal notch, but I'm not going to say that there is substernal extension. So going back to our checklist, the things we're gonna talk about on a preoperative CT of a thyroid mass, are there malignant features? What is the effect of the mass on the trachea? Compression, displacement. What is the extent of the mass? Superior, inferior, retropharyngeal. And if you run through those things, you'll help your surgeon be well prepared for the coming surgery.